Hi, this is Carrie Corbett Owen from Bodywise Perfect Size, talking to Karen Koenig. Karen, can you tell me a little about your journey? Um, as a kid, I didn't eat much, and then I had my tonsils out, and that, I don't know, it freed me up. And um, I was a chubby kid. My mom bought me clothes in the chubby girls department. They don't have those anymore, thank goodness. And um, then in my teens, I dieted. And I would write down in my, uh, my eating journal, only ate an apple today. Isn't that wonderful? Then, of course, I would binge on weekends. Just very dysregulated eating through my... 20s, I, was, I had bulimia for, oh, maybe a year and a half. I was working in advertising. It was very stressful. And uh, that got me into therapy for my eating problems, which was actually a really good thing. And then you had a friend who bought a franchise that you joined. She bought a franchise for a group called uh, Focus Awareness on Chronic Overeating. Quite a mouthful pun intended, and um, I was uh, the coordinator of facilitators, and I did the marketing for it, and it taught people how to eat normally, and this was in the early 80s when I was more recovered, but not quite fully recovered yet myself, so I was a, a step ahead of the people that I was teaching. To me, I had an, a master's in education. So you went back to college and got a master's in social work. And then I really felt fully prepared to help people in the way that I wanted to. I do believe that therapy does best when it's enjoyable. So we, we really laugh a lot and that helps people relax. And when people are relaxed, they learn more. Karen, you've been a very prolific author as well in this field. Can you tell me about your first book, The Rules of Normal Eating? It's based on the idea that there are four rules of normal eating. Not that I invented them, they were there already, but it's um, eating according to appetite, eating mostly when you're hungry, choosing foods that satisfy as opposed to good and bad foods, um, <clears throat> eating with awareness, and what we would call mindfulness now, and with an eye towards enjoying food, and stopping when full or satisfied. Karen, your second book was the Food and Feelings Workbook. And I wrote that because I, after having written the Rules of Normal Eating, I thought, oh, good, people that will now know what to do. And then I was noticing, of course, that emotions would get in the way when they wanted to eat according to appetite. So I thought about the emotions that seemed um, the biggest sticky wickets for the people that I was treating um, individually or um, through my workshops, and I came up with uh, different feelings, of some loneliness, confusion, helplessness, anxiety, um, and uh, guilt, uh, among others, that seem to really trigger um, mindless eating. The other thing was that people just seemed clueless about the purpose of emotions. You know, all they wanted to do was swat them away, run from them. And uh, again, in terms of evolution, they, they're they key to our lives. Um, so I wanted people to understand what feelings were for and to be comfortable going anywhere with any kinds of feelings. And um, I think people have a lot of relief when they manage feelings better. And again, that means you know, sometimes containing them and sometimes expanding them, but at least knowing what they're for, that they really have a purpose, as I like to tell them, other than to make us miserable. I think of emotions like our senses. They are there to give us information and help us negotiate life successfully. Um, I don't agree certainly with Freud about everything he said, but moving away from pain or threat of pain and towards pleasure. And if we can do that in life and do it relatively well, we will thrive and be successful and happy. And I love this title, Nice Girls Finish Fat. I wrote because I, when I would do workshops, I'd have these, all, these terrific, amazing 
talented women in the class, and I had an exercise in you know getting to know each other, and I'd say, well, what do you like best about yourself? And inevitably, the women would say, I'm nice, and I, I found that such a bland statement when there were so much else. So um, then I started to think about how being nice can get in the way of taking care of oneself because you're always giving to others and you're giving to yourself through food. And some of the characteristics that we were talking about, um, rigid all or nothing thinking, perfectionism, um, not liking to delegate, got to do it myself, people pleasing, wanted, um, wanting others approval, they are all traits of nice girls. And I wrote it to encourage women um, not to stop being nice, but to add niceness to their palate. And the way I put it is we don't want to just color with a nice crayon. We want to do like the boys do, get to color with all the colored crayons in the box. We talk a lot about uh, selfishness and what it means and where they got the mistaken idea that selfish or focused on self is a bad thing. And what I find is a couple things. Either, you know, women um, taking after mothers who were not selfish um, just thought, well, I guess that's a bad thing to be. Mom doesn't take care of herself. If she focuses on others. That's what I'll do. But also, many of them had in very, very selfish mothers. And they consciously or unconsciously vowed early on not to be like mom, but to be the opposite. And of course, whenever we want to be exactly like or the opposite from, um, we don't land up in a very good place. We want to be able to take care of ourselves and others. And that's what was missing in the paradigm that they were using. It was either or rather than and. You also wrote a book specifically aimed at therapists. W. W. Norton asked me to write a book for general therapists who have patients who come to them with eating or weight problems. Over, over time, general therapists are probably taking more classes, workshops, CEUs in eating disorders. But um, very often what they say, um, and it's still far too common, is we'll just go on a diet, just exercise more. They, they really don't understand uh, the roots of um, disordered or dysregulated eating, even if it's not a you know, full-blown uh, disorder. So I talk about it from a medical standpoint, from a skill standpoint, not making it a moral issue. You know, what, what we tend to want to do, and sometimes it's the exact wrong thing, which is, you know, prescribe something for clients to do, and they really um, need to find their own way out of it, and it's different for every client. Um, also, there's the whole transference issue that I cover. If, uh, if you have a patient who is of a high weight and a therapist who is of a low or normal weight, uh, the patient may say, oh, well, how could you understand me? If both are, have a high weight, then the patient can say, well, how can you help me? You can't tell, help yourself. Your most recent book is Outsmarting Overeating. I wrote that book, which is my last book, uh, because I realized that people who I was treating um, didn't just have food problems. They had problems in so many other areas of their life. And that if they attended uh, to those areas and developed better capacities and better skills in those areas. They would be less stressed, have more happiness, and when they were less stressed, they wouldn't turn so much to food. So uh, I really do ask them, what if it's not about food? What if it's the rest of your life that um, has gone awry? And um, for some people, that's a wonderful notion. They, they really like that because they say, I can learn skills. And for other clients, they're not so happy with that. You know, they, they want it to be the food because that's really what they want to talk about. Um, but 
there's just no way. Once you develop better life skills, eating becomes easier because the rest of life becomes easier. And when you are more competent, you're more confident. And then when you have more confidence, it leads you to try to be more confident. What are some of the skills that people need to learn? One is balancing work and play. Uh, people uh, with eating problems, they believe that productivity is better than just hanging around and doing nothing. Um, so to put that in balance is very important um, for, for several reasons. One is because we don't want to put too much stress on our lives. It's not good for our bodies. And the other is for this innate need to play and make a mess and not have consequences. I mean, that's a lot of the reason that people eat, because they can go unconscious. And um, so I say go out and do it in a more fun way. Why do it in a way that can hurt yourself? And um, it's sort of it's fun for me teaching people how to play and to find out to help them find out what is play to them. I, I remember one woman. Um, she came in one day and she said, "I bought a piano." And I said, "Really? I didn't even know you played the piano." And she said, "I didn't. I just wanted to learn it." And then that became something that she was so involved in that she would forget about eating. I mean, certainly creativity um, gets your dopamine going, and that you know that beats food uh, any day. Not not to the extent that you don't want to nourish yourself, but um, when you're in that zone or whatever it's called, um, it's just wonderful. So that one uh, self regulation uh, is another one not containing feelings too much and not um, expressing them uh, too much, being able to rely on yourself and others. It's not, it's not and or or, but usually we find either people totally don't go for help or they don't try at all to regulate their feelings and they always turn to other people um, to help them self-regulate emotions. You know, once you learn these skills, your whole life gets better. Visit us at bodywiseperfectsize.com for more fabulous interviews.